Dear comrades and friends, I convey warmest greetings to all participants in this book launch. I thank the East and Southeast Asian Studies section of the University of the Philippines Center for International Studies for inviting me to do a review of Rethinking Socialism by Deng Yuan Xu and Pao Yu Ching. I agree with Professor Ching in her introduction of the 2017 edition of this book that socialism in China did not fail because of inherent invalidity in theoretical and practical terms, but because it was defeated in a two-line class struggle between the socialist line of Comrade Mao and the bourgeois line of the capitalist rulers headed by Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. The book provides important facts, insights, and analysis regarding this struggle the main concern of the book is about the conflicting socialist and capitalist projects, but it also relates the economic issues to the political and cultural issues. Rethinking Socialism describes correctly the years of 1949 to 1952 in China as a period of rehabilitation and consolidation consequent to the overthrow of the joint dictatorship of the Comprador Big Bourgeoisie and Landlord Class which had been run by the Guomintang party and centered on the bureaucrat capitalist with a big comprador character. The newly born socialist state in the form of the People's Democratic Republic confiscated bureaucrat capital and foreign capital, which amounted to 80% of the fixed assets of industry and transport. It nationalized the banks, manufacturing, large-scale trading, mining, construction, transportation, and communications. It completed the confiscation of land reform from the landlords and redistribution of the land to the landless peasants. The task of the bourgeois democratic revolution were basically completed, but transitory measures of a bourgeois democratic character were still to be undertaken. Land reform laid the ground for the development of agricultural cooperation in three stages. State private enterprises were established to accommodate and absorb private capital. Workers' cooperatives were organized as the embryo of bigger enterprises. By 1953, China was ready to carry out the first of its five-year plans to develop the socialist economy. There was a high tide of enthusiasm in socialist construction. Public ownership of the means of production became predominant with state ownership of industries and collective ownership in agriculture. The basic socialist transformation of the economy was accomplished during the first five-year economic plan. But in 1956, the struggle between the socialist line represented by Mao and the bourgeois line represented by Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping emerged. Rethinking socialism gives us a clear account of this two-line struggle in terms of conflicting socialist and capitalist projects. In the first session of the eighth, Congress of the Communist Party of China in 1956, Liu and Deng exaggerated the negative side of the situation. They did not see the contradictions within and between the state and collective sectors of the economy as opportunities for solving them and advancing the socialist economy. They advocated the prolongation of concessions to the national bourgeoisie, the small entrepreneurs, and the rich peasants. The adoption of the second five-year plan under the banner of the Great Leap Forward in the second session of the Eighth Party Congress in 1958 essentially blocked the bourgeois line and capitalist projects of Liu and Deng. It was a well-proportioned and well-balanced plan of building the heavy and basic industries as the leading factor, developing agriculture and the communes as the base of the economy and light industry to serve immediately the consumer and production needs of the masses and to hasten accumulation. Tremendous odds were overcome, including the Soviet revisionist tearing up of contracts and blueprints and abandonment of ongoing projects and the persistent attempts of the capitalist rulers to sabotage the great leap forward. Following their, their Soviet revisionist mentors, the capitalist rulers preached that the communes would fail because it was not preceded by mechanization. To counter the communes, they pushed the line of three freedoms and one contract. While the general trend and the great leap forward spelled a great victory 
for the socialist revolution and construction, adverse circumstances and mistakes were exaggerated to misrepresent it and ridicule the leadership of Mao. But the problems and difficulties were overcome after the first bumper crop of the communes came in 1962, Mao launched the socialist education movement in 1963. The capitalist order systematically undermined and sabotaged the socialist education movement. Thus, it became necessary to launch the great proletarian cultural revolution in 1966 because of the growing manifestations of revisionism within the party and the state and the deleterious influence and blatant threats of Soviet social imperialism. I had the good fortune to be in China when the GPCR started. The main objective of the GPCR was to combat modern revisionism, prevent the restoration of capitalism, and consolidate socialism, and to revolutionize the, the superstructure to further promote the development of the socialist mode of production. Instead of barely using top-down directives, the CPC under Mao's leadership aimed to arouse and mobilize the masses to advance proletarian socialist politics, economy, and culture, to press demands on the officials of the CPC and the state, criticize those who were errant, and overthrow the incorrigibles. The Central Committee of the CPC issued the May 16th Circular, to guide the GPCR in 1966. The signal mass event was the rise up of the Red Guards among the student youth who rebelled against the work teams deployed by Liu Xiaoqi. Mao hailed the Red Guards as revolutionary successors and called on them to bombard the, the bourgeois headquarters within the Communist Party. At the same time, he called on the People's Liberation Army to support the left. In January 1967, the workers established the Shanghai Commune to overthrow the Shanghai Municipal Committee, but the instruction later came from the party to form revolutionary committees. The revolutionary committee became the model for establishing the organs of political power. New arrangements for responsible bodies in factories and in the communes were made. They were constituted by the representatives of the cadres, the masses, and the experts. Caters were rotated to perform functions of leadership and to do low-level work among the masses. The charter of the Anshan Iron and Steel Company became a model for the mobilization of the masses and materials and resources to achieve greater success with revolutionary politics in command of production. The touching model was used for industry and the Dachai model for agriculture. With revolutionary politics in command of production and the mass movements steering the entire country, the annual rates of economic growth went up beyond 10% in the entire course of the GPCR. Inspired by the GPCR, the most experienced skaters, scientists, engineers, and the educated youth fanned out from their urban con concentrations in order to serve and assist in the building of industries, development of communes, and cultural upliftment of the people in the less developed and backward areas of China. The students were mobilized to do mass work among the workers and peasants. The theatrical models were being performed everywhere. Rural clinics and barefoot doctors were all over to serve the peasants in the most remote areas. In terms of delegates and elected officers of the Central Committee, the 9th Congress of the, of the CPC reflected the initial achievements and objectives of the GPCR and the main forces and cadres that became prominent in the years of 1966 to 1969. The leadership of Mao was upheld and so was Lim Biao as his closest comrade in arms. The Shanghai Group of Four, Jiang Jing, Wang Hongwen, Yao Wenyuan, and uh, Zhang Chunqiao, was also on the rise. But soon after the Ninth Party Congress, Lin Piao would be the target of accusations of scheming to make a coup until he died in a plane crash together with top defense officials close to him. The Group of Four from Shanghai kept their positions and increased their criticism of Lin Piao and also Chou Enlai as Confucius and then as Chou in the Noble Water Margin. 
But Zhou Enlai maintained this close comradeship with Mao. Twists and turns would occur in the GPCR, including the rehabilitation of Deng and then his removal from his high office after the death of Zhou in February 1976 for pushing his four modernizations, denounced his comprador bourgeois ideology, and then his success after the death of Mao in September 1976 at making a counter-revolutionary coup against the GPCR in collaboration with the centrist group of uh, CPC chairman Hua Ho Feng. Because it is focused on the contest between socialist and capitalist projects, rethinking socialism such only a few personalities and groups in the political struggles, especially in the central organs of the CPC. However, it gives enough indicators for further research and discussion in order to know more about the identity and roles of the political actors in the zigzag of developments due to the two-line struggle within the CPC and the Chinese socialist state. The issues debated and fought over were domestic and international. In foreign policy, China took a significant step in rapprochement and normalization of relations with the U.S. in 1972. In this connection, Deng Xiaoping drew a diagram of the world consisting of a first world of two superpowers, second world of less developed capitalist countries, and a third world of countries and peoples in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Expectant of future excellent relations with the U.S., he and his staff drew up his scheme of four modernizations and ultimately the plan of reforms and opening up to the U.S. and the world capitalist system. Through the 1976 Dengist coup, the class dictatorship of the proletariat was overthrown by the bourgeoisie. The counter-revolutionary plotters arrested and detained not just the so-called Gang of Four, but tens of thousands of cadres aligned with the GPCR, and millions of CPC members were expelled and replaced by those hostile to the GPCR. Consequently, the Dengist declared the GPCR as a complete catastrophe and that Mao was 100% in error for it. They were able to carry out capitalist-oriented economic reforms, mainly by changing the socialist character of the state-owned enterprises to state capitalist, expanding the private sector of the economy, dismantling the commune system, and privatizing the rural industries. They opened up and integrated the Chinese economy with the world capitalist system and joined the U.S. in carrying out the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization. Rethinking Socialism is an excellent summary and analysis of the victory of socialism and subsequent defeat in China. It provides us with substantial points to study and understand the causes and processes involved in the victory of socialism and subsequently its defeat so that in the future the proletariat and the people will know the basic principles and methods to apply and develop in order to win in the struggle for socialism as the transition to communism. We can learn from the positive and negative lessons in order to achieve greater victories for the socialist cause. Thank you.